Hi, this is Kevin Winthrop, Professor of Infectious Diseases and Epidemiology here at Oregon Health Science University in Portland, Oregon. Jack uh, asked me to do just a real quick summary of a couple of uh, vaccines in the context of the difficult decisions in rheumatology series. Uh, wanted me to comment on first, you know, shingles prevention and um, Shingrix, the, the current vaccine. Uh, there are not a lot of difficult decisions here. I mean, the decision to whether or not someone should get Shingrix is, is very clear. ACR guidance we just released this last year. I was on the committee. I mean, we weighed in very firmly like, hey, if you're 18 and above and immunosuppressed, you should be vaccinated with Shingrix. I think the difficult decisions really come down to how to do it. And unfortunately, we have a tremendous lack of data. Um and this is with regards to DMAR management. I, I think, you know, if you extrapolate from influenza and COVID-19 vaccines, and you look at the couple presentations, there's been at ULAR and ACR in the last year or two, none of which are published, by the way. But there is suggestion that, uh, you know, jack, jack inhibitors or, you know, maybe just rheumatologists, patients in general have diminished responses to this vaccine. And I, I would argue, yes, I'm sure rheumatology patients or particularly RA patients have diminished vaccine responses. That's pretty much true of any vaccine. Uh, but some DMARs may may make that more marked. Um, I think, you know, we presented a ULR last year, UPA, and UPA methotrexate, pretty much everyone was on background methotrexate. And only about two thirds of patients had, you know, what we call satisfactory cell mediated responses, which you know, in the general population, that's pretty close to, you know, 95, 100%. So um, I would suspect that, uh, you know, if I had a patient coming in, I, I would suspect their DMAR, some of them may diminish responses. How that translates to diminished efficacy, I don't know. Jeff Curtis and I are doing a big study right now trying to sort this out. It's going to take a couple of years. Other people are looking at it. But I, I do think uh, I do think probably if I had a patient now coming in, in fact, I did today. I just got home from clinic. You know, I'd stopped her methotrexate for, you know, at least a week, one to two weeks after, at the time of vaccination. Most people functionally end up in the seven to 10 day range, you know, based on where they are when they come in, something like that. But I, I would, and I'd consider stopping their jack for a week, and I'd probably skip a dose of ABBA. I mean, these are things that, again, extrapolate from our COVID data and the guidance around COVID vaccine. Uh, and we don't have data specific to Shingrix yet, at least not that's been published, but I, I do think that's the way it's looking. But we do need better studies to like figure out how to optimize the immunogenicity and then the long-term efficacy of that big vaccine. I will say the long-term efficacy data was just published in the general population. It looks phenomenal. Uh, the immunogenicity really holds up. I mean, it was almost, it barely dropped at all for both humoral and cell mediated responses over 10 years. There was some diminishment in, in efficacy. It went from like 95%-ish to 78%-ish or 75%-ish. So it dropped a little bit. I mean, maybe that argues that people should be getting boosters at year 10 or something, but we'll sort that out later. Um, but still 73, 75% of 10 years is, is pretty darn good for maintenance of efficacy. So I do think this vaccine will help with patients. I would give it, I think about holding some DMARDs at the time of vaccination and, you know, we'll sort out hopefully with some of our studies about when to give a booster and how to, how to further hone this management. The last comment is about RSV vaccine. Um, all my patients are asking, some of yours I'm sure are as well. There's two new vaccines, Pfizer and GSK, both had approved products in the last few months. There are ACI PCC recommendations out about using them in patients over 60 and above with quote unquote shared decision-making. I love that term. Anyway, we should always be shared decision-making. I think that's what we've always been doing as doctors, but now we have this term that gets applied to everything, particularly when we don't want to issue a firm recommendation. So there's no firm recommendation. However, if you look at the data in patients who are 65 and up, particularly, particularly those with comorbidities, chronic heart and lung disease, um, there, there isn't any data specific to rheumatology that I'm aware of. Maybe it's out there. I haven't seen it. Um, speaking to increased risk associated with rheumat rheumatic diseases or various forms of DMR immunosuppression. But there certainly is a lot of data in other immunosuppressive settings and really just this comorbidity type um, setting. 
And patients with a variety of these problems are definitely at higher risk. And they're in that vaccine recommendation category of shared decision making. So, I, I mean, I had two patients today. They're above 60. They have chronic lung disease. I, I'm going to vaccinate them. And I, I don't think it matters which vaccine. They both look very similar in terms of their efficacy and phase three trials in terms of their safety. Um, they look quite good. There was a couple rare, like one in 10,000 type uh, neurologic events like Guillain-Barre or um, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. These are rare vaccine type events. Um, they did occur in s- some of the patients and patients who got vaccinated uh, concomitantly with flu and the RSV vaccine. So for now, my recommendation would be to keep them separate. I like to keep vaccines separate anyway. I mean, I know we do these studies to make sure it's okay to do them together. And I think that's good to do. But I generally tend to like to use both my arms. And if I get two vaccines, I can't use both my arms. So I tend to keep them separate. But uh, I think for the RSV vaccine, I would definitely do it alone for now. But I would recommend it based on the data. Um, and it looks, again, to be probably a one-shot deal. There's no recommendations in terms of boosters yet. The GSK program actually re-randomized people to get a booster at year one versus not. And the people who didn't get a booster were at the same efficacy level as the people who did. So there's really no benefit to a year one booster. So for now, these are one-shot deals with boosters two years or later. Um, We'll have to see how the data shakes out. So that's all I'll say. Jack, I hope you're well. And I hope that helps solve some problems in this difficult space. And uh, thanks very much. And carry on. Cheers.